ischemia occurs when there is an imbalance between the supply of nutrients from the blood versus the demand of the organ. If we're going to place this in the context of cardiac ischemia, then make sure we understand the difference between hypoxia, which is a decrease in the oxygen supply, versus ischemia, which is not only a decrease in oxygen, but also a decrease in nutrients. As well, because ischemia implies no blood flow, there is also an inability to clear any of the waste byproducts. So as a general rule, hypoxia is much better tolerated in an organ than ischemia. So when we talk about ischemia in the heart, we really want to talk about this balance between supply and demand. You can sort of think about it as putting it on a teeter-totter, and we can see that the supply is going to be driven by the oxygen content of the blood, and then the actual blood flow. And blood flow is going to be proportional to the perfusion pressure and the resistance of the vessel. That's going to bring us to Poiseuille's law to discuss those two. What drives demand in the heart? Well, the parameters that measure demand are going to include wall stress, heart rate, and they're going to be driven by contractility. So every time you think about a patient with angina, because this is going to present as pain, we're always thinking about the supply versus demand. The O2 content, that's pretty straightforward. The only disease that we really think about that's going to involve a drop in O2 content, in practical terms, are going to be our anemias. When your patient's hemoglobin starts dropping below, say, 10 grams per cent, they might start expressing chest pain. When we talk about blood flow, this really is Poiseuille's law. Poiseuille's law states the parameters that account for the flow. So let's let flow stand for Q. Remember that it's going to be proportional to the change in pressure times R to the fourth and decreased with increased viscosity of the fluid and the length of the vessel. The key parameter that we're going to be using, obviously, is R to the fourth because that's going to be related to atherosclerotic occlusions of the coronary artery. Resistance specifically refers to the R to the fourth of the diameter. When we talk about the demand side, we really have to review our understanding of wall stress because this comes out of Laplace's law. Laplace's law states that wall stress is proportional to the pressure in the structure times the radius of the chamber divided by the thickness of the wall. In practical terms, the proxies that we use for wall stress are going to be left ventricular end diastolic pressure or volume. In practical terms, the pressure in the chamber, that's just blood pressure. And then thickness of the wall is the thickness of the left ventricular wall, and radius is the chamber diameter. Heart rate is self-explanatory, so the only other parameter we really need to make sure we have a grasp of is contractility, and contractility really is proportional to our intracellular calcium level. This is going to be highly driven by our autonomic nervous system, increasing with sympathetic input and decreasing with cholinergic input. How does the blood supply get given to the heart? Well, we always want to talk about our blood supply as we reviewed in our anatomy section as the subepicardial coronary artery going down through progressively smaller vessels through small arteries and then into the arterioles, which are really one to two millimeter, very small tubules that only have one to two small mu muscle layers. We have flow through the epicardial artery, but resistance is at the level of the arteriole. Anytime we need to increase blood flow with demand, we can dilate the arterioles. Regulating demand is not going to be through the level of the epicardial artery, but through the level of the arterioles. Regulation at the level of the small arteries.